This video was brought to you by my loyal patrons. Pledge today and you can participate in choosing what video comes to the channel next. Link in the description. About a year ago, I made this huge retrospective video on all of Disney and Pixar's Cars films. And in that video, I said this. It's not Incredibles tier or Toy Story tier, but... And I also said this. My least favorite Pixar film is Incredibles 2, which was just a cash grab copy of the first movie with the two main roles swapped. So today, I'm going to elaborate on that. We are going to do something very different for the channel with this video. No trains this time, or boats, or cars. Now today we're going to talk about one of my other great childhood loves, Pixar, and what I think is their best movie. The Incredibles is Pixar's best film, and I know I'm not alone in that sentiment. I'm someone who is pretty ambivalent to the superhero genre as a whole, but somehow, The Incredibles spoke to me. It blew me away back in 2004 when it first came out. I loved it, my parents loved it, and the world clearly loved it, because it ended up being one of the highest grossing movies of that year. What I'd like to do today is break down why The Incredibles is so clever and groundbreaking, and how its sequel, Incredibles 2, in my opinion, completely missed the mark. Let's first start by taking a trip back in time. The Incredibles was a concept that dated as far back as 1993, as drawings as a family of superheroes director Brad Bird had done during the period of his life he had tried to break into film. Bird, who was in his mid-30s at the time, was feeling the conflict between career and family responsibilities, and he sort of projected these feelings onto these characters. Consciously, this was just a funny movie about superheroes, but I think what was going on in my life definitely filtered into the movie. Bird broke into film with his directorial debut, The Iron Giant, in 1999. The movie sadly bombed. So Bird returned to his idea of a superhero family. He pitched the idea to his college friend John Lasseter, who was then the CCO of Pixar Animation Studios. And he loved the idea. In no time at all, Bird was brought on to direct the studio's sixth theatrical film, a movie about a superhero family called... The Incredibles. The Incredibles subverts the then collective expectation of a superhero film and focuses on a family of superheroes who are, well, forced to not be super. The movie focuses on Bob Parr, aka Mr. Incredible, his wife Helen, aka Elastigirl, and their children in a world where superheroes are deemed dangerous and were forced into retirement and hiding. Bob, who continually longs for the glory days, is now a depressed, broken man who works a boring office job for a company that he hates, but he does it to provide for his family. But one fateful day, Bob is presented with an opportunity to be super again in secret for an undisclosed employer, and he takes it. The story focuses on his journey to regain the glory days and the stress that puts on his family. I'm assuming if you're watching this video, then you've seen the movie before. It's almost 20 years old now. Wow. So I think I can just jump into the specifics of why this movie works so well without really explaining the plot. <laughs> the first thing I'd love to talk about is the structure. Mr. Incredible is the main character, and I love how the first half of the movie solely focuses on him. They establish all the characters at the beginning. Helen, Lucius, Dash, Violet but they're not that important to the plot at the time. The first half is all about Bob's midlife crisis and his trying to regain the spark in his life again. Once he obtains that, and the twist is revealed, and we hit about the halfway mark, the story renders Mr. Incredible incapacitated so we can shift focus. The movie is called The Incredibles, not Mr. Incredible. So once he's put out of the picture for a while, now they can show what the rest of the family is made of. We get a whole chunk of the movie where the family has to survive in the wild on their own vices, which concludes with them reuniting with Bob, and then they all come together as a team for the final battle. 
It's a brilliantly structured movie that gives all its characters a proper amount of time in the spotlight. No one here feels neglected or has a lack of characterization. Another thing that I find notable about this movie is the passage of time. I feel a trap a lot of movies fall into is how all the crazy events of the story happen in the span of a couple days. Like take the original Star Wars for instance. Great movie, great storytelling. But the total passage of time of this entire story is like two days. Luke knew Obi-Wan for like four hours before he was killed. And the very next day, Luke is flying in the Rebellion. But it's a movie, and the audience isn't supposed to think about stuff like that. The Incredibles, however, plays out the span of time the story takes place in a far more realistic way. Days, maybe even weeks pass between major story beats. The day of the dinner scene and the fire occurs, and then what could be weeks later, Bob gets fired and meets Mirage. The big working out family life montage could be weeks, months even for all we know. The passage of time in this adds a level of realism to the story, it makes all of what we're seeing feel the more real and grounded, despite being an animated movie about superheroes with cartoony proportions. Something that I greatly appreciate is how tightly written this story is. Everything is set up and paid off. Set up and pay off is a pretty common thing in screenwriting, but you'd be amazed how many movies don't utilize it. Syndrome, for example, has a big setup in the prologue and a major payoff later when he's revealed as the villain. They could have just revealed the big villain character and have him state he's an old foe of Bob's or something, but no, they bothered to set him up all the way in the prologue so the audience isn't confused later on. Even little things are all set up. Dash doesn't just notice an android bird watching him on the island. They showed the bird way earlier watching Bob. Lucius doesn't just randomly have a wife in this scene. No, it's revealed way earlier that he's married. Say hello to honey for me, Lucius. Well, we'll do. Uh, good night, Helen. Good night, kids. Some random kid doesn't just witness the family survive a plane crash. They showed the kid earlier watching Bob lift the car. Syndrome isn't just sucked into the jet engine of the plane because his cape got stuck. No, they brilliantly set that up earlier when Edna explained her reason for not wanting a cape on Bob's new suit. In what in the moment just seems like a funny, light-hearted gag montage. No capes! They don't just reveal Dash can run fast during the dinner scene. They imply it earlier without showing it. I want to talk about that. I love how clever Dash's powers are set up. The scene in the principal's office is of course iconic. Everyone can quote this word for word, because it is undeniably hilarious. Coincidence? I think not! Notice though that they do not once state that his superpower is running fast. It's just sort of implied. You know something's up, and you know by Dash's smirk on his face as he walks out, that he did in fact use his powers to fool the teacher. And then in the car ride home, Dash says, I promise I'll slow up. I'll only be the best by a tiny bit. But we don't really know what he means by that. And then in the dinner scene, Bob congratulates Dash for going fast. You must have been booking. How fast do you think you were Bob. going? Okay, so all the information is there, but they still haven't shown it. And then they do. It's a nice little aha moment. This movie is so clever. That's just classic Pixar in general for you. I find all of their classic movies so clever. It's just quality writing. The pace of this movie is quick, and they make such efficient use of time to tell their story. Every single scene, no matter how quick or funny, feeds the audience new information. Let's take a look at that dinner scene. This scene is in total three minutes long, but the amount of information that is established here is impressive. Bob is an aloof father at home, more concerned with what's going on in the world than what's happening right in front of him and notably perks up when he hears his children have used their superpowers. Helen respects the law and tries to keep the family together, but will use her powers to do so if necessary. Violet hates having powers and just wants to be normal like all the other kids at her school, and is also trying to hide her crush on Tony from the family, and also has force field abilities. No! Hey, no force field! We only saw her use invisibility earlier. Bob and Lucius still hang out, and Lucius is married now. Jack-Jack is the only normal one of the family, and we get the payoff of seeing Dash actually running fast that was alluded to earlier, but never shown. 
By the time this scene ends, the audience now knows everything they need to know about these characters to get the story started. It's insane how much information they feed us in this quick three minute scene. It's so efficient, it wastes no time. Another example of the movie cleverly not wasting time is in Syndrome's reveal. I think the first question we all wonder right as soon as we meet him is, how does he afford all of this? Mr. Incredible gets him to monologue to buy time to throw a log at him, and in that monologue, Syndrome answers that exact question. And they will pay through the nose to get it. How do you think I got rich? I invented weapons. It's basic exposition that we need to know to understand the character, but they work it into the scene to make it a little bit more interesting. How much more uninteresting would this have been if Syndrome just started monologuing and it was just Mr. Incredible standing there listening to him? No, instead, they cleverly inserted some action to keep the pace moving. You sly dog! You got me monologuing! I can't believe I love the art design of this film. The art deco design of everything is so stylish and unique to this film, very unlike other Pixar films. Everything is based on a simple shape, like how the Omnidroid is a giant circle, or those little monorail cars on the island are just little oval spheres. Everything in the Insuracare office and the elements of Bob's depressing part of his life are squares and rectangles with hard edges, including his boss, etc. Even all the characters are based on simple shapes to differentiate them from each other. Bob is very square and robust. Helen is made of curves and circles. Violet is like a stick, etc. None of these models have extraordinary detail on them. No major prominent wrinkles or super defined lips or anything. They're simple by design and they aren't trying to be photorealistic or anything. Humans are notoriously the hardest thing to create in CGI. And Pixar will be the first to tell you that. Have you seen the humans in their early films? Like that scary ass baby in Tin Toy? Even old Andy and Sid look pretty uncanny in Toy Story. In addition, Bird's film stars an all human cast. Pixar, which pioneered the new art of computer graphics animation, has stuck to non human characters, toys, and monsters, and fish, because animators traditionally have had trouble making humans look realistic. So, knowing this, why would they have greenlit a movie starring all humans? How did they work around that? Simple. They're all cleverly stylized, with very unhuman like proportions. The simple looks of the characters matches that geometric art deco world that they're placed in. It's extremely clever production design on Pixar's part. It's like how the reason they went ahead with focusing their first movie on toys was in part due to the limitations of CGI at the time. CGI models and textures looked very plasticky back then. So the toys didn't look uncanny, they just looked like toys. This isn't a matter of Pixar pushing the limits with what can be done in CGI. This is a matter of them being smart with what they can do with the current restraints of CGI and presenting it in the best possible way they can. And that's why they were so revolutionary for the time. So we've gone through it all. I love the structure of this movie. I love the cleverness of the writing. I love how efficiently the story is told, and I love the production design. But that's something that can be said about most of Pixar's classic films. What separates The Incredibles from the rest of the films and their library, in my opinion, is how adult it is. This movie does not play down to kids. There are many elements here that are straight out of a PG-13 film, like how Helen suspects Bob is having an affair. They never outright state it, but it's so clear that's what she's suspicious of. There's actually a deleted scene where she flat out asks him if he's cheating on her. Cleaners. This is not old hair. Why don't you ask what you want to ask? Are you having an affair? It's so understandable why she suspects this. Bob was so miserable before, and then out of nowhere he's happy and losing weight. From her perspective, she has no idea what changed. It's only natural of her mind to go straight to, he's having an affair. Or how about Bob believing his family was killed in the plane explosion and seeing what that does to his psyche? Release me! Now! Or what? I'll crush her. They take a crazy long time to reveal to him that they're actually alive still. He went a good chunk of this movie thinking his wife and children were dead. It's so dark. Or how about Helen flat out telling her kids that some people in the world will just flat out kill them if given the chance? Well, these guys are not like those guys. 
They won't exercise restraint because your children, they will kill you if they get the chance. No subtlety here whatsoever. It's blunt and scary and real. No sugarcoating. There's a deleted scene where Helen's old friend Snug is killed in the plane crash. And they did this originally to show just how serious the villains were. They cut it ultimately for time, because all the time that would have been needed to establish Snug and make us care about him before he died. It's actually a pretty cool sequence, and I love the somber moment when Dash asks, What about the, the pilot? <gasps> I think axing the character was a smart decision, not just to keep the pace moving, but so we're able to focus our emotions more on Bob mourning the loss of his family. More so than Helen mourning an ultimately non-important supporting character. It's not just the topics the film addresses that makes this feel adult. It's also how it lets the scenes play out. Let's look back at that dinner scene again. The dinner scene feels like a regular scene out of a regular movie. It's a very natural conversation they're having with very real sounding dialogue from the characters. Tony Ridinger. Shut up. Well, you are. I said shut up, you little insect. Well, she is. Do not shout at the table. Honey? Kids, listen to your mother. The kids talk like how actual kids of that age would talk. It doesn't sound like dialogue written by an adult for a kid. There's no music or anything. It feels very real, despite our characters looking like how they do, and they just happen to have superpowers. That's something pretty unique to The Incredibles. It's contemporariness. All the dialogue scenes in this movie feel very real. This scene here doesn't feel like cartoon superheroes doing a bit. It feels like a wife and husband having a fight about how unhappy they are in life right now. They keep creating new ways to celebrate mediocrity, but if someone is genuinely exceptional, this then This is not they... about you, Bob. This is about Dash. You want to do something for Dash? Then let him actually compete. Let him go out for sports. I will not be made the enemy here. You know why we can't do that. Because it'd be great! This is not about you! I cannot stress enough that The Incredibles is a family drama first and foremost, and a superhero movie second. This is not at all a new thing in superhero movies nowadays, but for 2004, this was trailblazing. Pretty ironic that the most real feeling superhero movie of the time was the one with no real filmed elements in it. All of this can be attributed to Brad Bird and his approach to making animated movies. I was wondering, at any point did you consider using real actors for the film? Or were you always gonna make it an animated movie? Why? <laughs> Animation's much more fun. People think of animation only doing things where people are dancing around and doing right. a lot of histrionics, but animation is not a genre. And people keep saying, the animation genre. It's not a genre. A Western is a genre. Animation is an art form, and it can do any genre. You know, it could do a detective film, a cowboy film, a horror film, an R-rated film, or a kid's fairy tale. But it doesn't do one thing. He doesn't view animation as solely something for kids. It's not a genre, it's a medium to tell a story. Regardless of the age demographic it's intended for, and you see that greatly in this, and in his other films, The Iron Giant and Ratatouille. Two films that many would argue are some of the greatest animated films of all time. And this right here is why The Incredibles has and will continue to age so well. It can be enjoyed by kids and adults. A kid watching this movie in 2004 could enjoy it for the cool superhero stuff. And the same kid watching it 20 years later can enjoy it for all the more grounded elements. Like most of Pixar's classic films, it manages to transcend age and time. Now, The Incredibles is not a perfect movie. It nearly is. I might even argue that it's pretty damn close to being perfect, but it isn't without some minor negatives. There's little plot inconsistencies, like how Edna Mode somehow knows the exact sizes to design the Par Children's suits without ever meeting them, or how Vi and Dash manage to sneak into the jet without Helen noticing. Like yeah, Viola could have just gone invisible and hidden in the car or something, but how did Dash get there? Did he like, run alongside the car or something? or how the guards driving this car didn't notice Helen standing there. <gasps> They're really not going to check in on who that strange woman in red standing on the tracks was? These are all incredibly nitpicky things that can be forgiven though. 
Because ultimately, they don't matter. What matters here is the storytelling, and what a feat of collaborative filmmaking this was. All of these amazing minds and talents being mixed together, complete with a pitch-perfect score from Michael Giacchino, creates not one of, but the best movie Pixar has put out in their library. The Incredibles is, in my opinion, an absolute masterpiece. So, in 2014, in the midst of the wake of endless superhero movies and pointless sequels and reboots to cash in on nostalgia, it's no surprise that Disney CEO Bob Iger announced to the world that they were finally making an incredible sequel, with Brad Bird returning as writer and director. Brad Bird has stated before that the reason he never made another Incredibles movie is because the creative team didn't want to make one just for the sake of making money. The thing is, many sequels are cash grabs. There's a saying in the business that I can't stand, where they go, if you don't make another one, you're leaving money on the table. So if this were a cash grab, we would not have taken 14 years. It's purely a story we wanted to tell. At this point in time, I was a little burnt out on Pixar, so I remember my reaction wasn't anything crazy. But I'd be lying if I said I wasn't interested in what sort of story they were going to tell here. And the more I thought about it, the more I realized the huge gap of time between movies opened a door to many possibilities. By the time the movie came out, it had been 14 years since the first one. Would they age up the characters? Would Dash and Violet be adults now, and Jack-Jack a teenager? Would Bob and Helen be in their mid-50s? How would they evolve the setting? What would the world be like now that supers were accepted again? There's so many things that they could do. I saw the movie on opening day, and very bizarrely, it began with this weird opening of the actors talking to the audience. I sadly couldn't find any footage of this opening anywhere, but it was Craig T. Nelson, Holly Hunter, and Brad Bird basically apologizing for how long this movie took to make. I thought that was very bizarre. Like, why did they make this? Why is this here? As weird as it was, it did heighten my expectations in that moment. If they're trying to hype us up for the movie, and apologizing for how long it took, surely it was bound to be a crazy adventure, right? The movie starts, and... Oh. It starts right off where the last one ended. Literally, the millisecond the previous movie ended. The same battle, same everything. No time jump. Almost immediately, I got really upset at what was happening. Right after the opening battle, they say that so much damage was caused that supers will be made illegal again. Oh my god. It's the same goddamn plot as the first movie. Supers are illegal and the family has to go into hiding again. Rick Dicker relocates them. And then they have another dinner scene that basically covers the same information that it did in the first movie. The kids are frustrated with being restricted with their powers. Helen's trying to keep the family under control. Bob's upset with the bureaucracy, etc. Yeah, they're saying different dialogue and are technically in a different setting, but fundamentally, these scenes are the same. Lucius shows up afterwards that leads the characters to the first step of the plot, etc. Some rich person tries to get in touch with the supers to do secret hero work, and then one of the parents goes off to be the hero in the A plot, while the other one stays at home with the kids in the B plot. Parent A gets in with a twist villain that wants to kill all supers. Parent B goes to save them, and the kids are brought along reluctantly and get involved. And the day is saved by the family working together as a team, blah, blah, blah. Beat for beat, it is the same exact story. The Incredibles 2 is the same movie as the first, with just the two main leads swapped, and some little tweaks here and there. Let's go into detail about the movie's two plots. First up is the A plot, which focuses on Helen, who is kind of the movie's main character this time in favor of Bob. I'll just start out and say that I'm actually okay with them swapping the leads. We got the Bob character arc in the first movie. The second movie is a good opportunity to shift focus on other characters. I am a-okay with Helen being the lead of this. What I'm not okay with is Helen now being kind of an idiot. In the first movie, Helen is shown to be an incredibly witty and clever person. 
She's very talented, able to fly a plane, she comes up with solutions to dire problems on the spot, and pieces together that Bob is hiding something from her fairly quickly. In this movie, she goes to the exact place DevTech sends her to watch for crime, just out in the open, and what a coincidence, something crazy bad occurs while she just happens to be there. Both times she does this. Does she really not suspect that DevTech might be behind all this? That just maybe she's being had? They establish that she knows Evelyn is very tech savvy. No, screen slaver, you're tech savvy. Like, come on, Helen, how blind are you? All screen slaver needs to do to hypnotize someone is get a screen in front of their eyes. But what if the screen doesn't look like a screen? Oh my god! How have you not put two and two together yet? Years of mandated hiding and silence have made us bitter. You bring us out into the light only to clean up the messes your lack of discipline creates. Oh my god! Is everyone stupid? They're all wearing the same goggles as Screen Slaver, and no one thinks this is weird? We're all just gonna go along with this then? So the plot can happen? Oh god. Helen, our main character, also doesn't have a character arc. There isn't a lesson she learns by the end of the movie. At the beginning of the movie, she states she abides by the law. And by the end of the movie, it doesn't really seem like her character has changed much from that. I don't even really understand her desire to be in the spotlight as a superhero, or what any of her goals are. She's just kind of doing this for fun, I guess? Our main character isn't the driving force of what happens in the story. Things just sort of happen to her as she goes along for the ride. Funnily enough, Bob is the one with the character arc again, but he's stuck in the B-plot. I'll get to that. Evelyn, the sister of DevTech CEO, is an incredibly unsurprising twist villain. It's too obvious that Bob Odenkirk's character isn't going to be the main villain. The sleazy capitalist businessman, yeah, it's a little too on the nose. Clearly they aren't going to reveal that he's the villain. So the whole time I was there thinking, well, it's not going to be him, so it's clearly going to be the sister. You know, the one that keeps standing in the shadows of each scene and argues with her brother all the time and made kind of a weird, bizarre entrance? Did they think this reveal was going to blow our minds or something? Because they didn't hide it very well. Her motivation to keep the supers illegal doesn't even make sense. So some robbers broke into her parents' house and shot her father. And because the supers didn't get there in time, a span of time that was like 30 seconds, she blames supers for her father's death, not the robbers? What? But father insisted they call his superhero friends. He died, waiting for heroes to save the day. That sounds like more of a problem that you have with your dad, girl. Not supers. My question is, why the need for this twist villain at all? Yeah, Syndrome was kind of a twist villain in the first movie, but they never made you think it was someone other than him. Watching the movie again, yeah, it's pretty clear the kid in the prologue would be the villain later, but so much time passes between that and his reveal that you kind of forget about him. So it's still a little bit of a surprise when he shows up. Incredibles 2 came out in an era where it seemed every Disney movie had a twist villain, and it's a little old now. Almost feels like it was a requirement from Disney themselves or something. A lot of this movie feels that way. I'm sorry, but she'll go to prison. Well, I'm sorry she's rich and will probably get no more than a slap on the wrist. What the hell was this line in there for? Social commentary? Was it supposed to imply Evelyn will be back for a future movie or something? I'm all for social commentary if that's what this was. But having it inserted here, in what is supposed to be the big satisfying final moment where the heroes beat the villain, totally kills the mood. What am I supposed to feel here now? Should I not be happy that the heroes just won the day or something? God, this sucks. Okay, so the A plot sucks. Let's talk about the B plot, which focuses on Bob and his wacky adventures of being a stay-at-home dad. Bob is useless to the plot of this movie. He takes the sideline while Helen gets the spotlight. He does get a lot of screen time, but what he does contributes nothing overall until he rejoins with Helen in the third act. There's this tension between him and Helen that comes from his being jealous of her, but it ultimately goes nowhere. It's kind of just forgotten about by the time he leaves for the final battle. All of what Bob does in this movie is just do stuff at home with the kids until the plot needs him for the final battle. There's a subplot with Violet having boy troubles at school, 
which they already did in the first movie. Tony's mind is wiped in the opening scene, which to me just feels like an excuse to do the same plot over again. A lot of time is spent on Jack-Jack, which is surprising since he was barely in the first movie. He was really just kind of a plot device. The final trick up the villain's sleeve to pull one over on the family. They spend so much time on Jack-Jack this time, even devoting a whole scene where he uses his new powers to fight a raccoon. Naturally, you'd think this would go somewhere, but it doesn't. Jack-Jack's involved in the final battle, but he's just kind of an annoyance. Vi and Dash are trying to save their parents, but Jack-Jack keeps like wandering off. He's more of an obstacle the other characters have to keep getting around to attain the goal, instead of him actually being useful and contributing something. Like, he grows big and smushes some of the bad guys. That's it? That's the big payoff to the movie spending so much time on him? So why have him be involved at all? Oh wait, I know why. There's also this scene of Bob finding out that Jack-Jack has powers. You have powers! <laughs> yeah, baby! At first, this reveal comes off as exciting and heartwarming, since the family never found out on screen in the last movie that he does. But like, doesn't this break continuity? Wouldn't the family have heard from Rick about all the stuff that happened with Kari while she was babysitting him? Jack-Jack is wearing a mask at the end of the first film, implying he's going to be involved in the fight, which would mean the family knew he had powers by that point, right? Dash is in this, and he doesn't do a damn thing. His big contribution to the story is that he has homework to do. He calls the car. He has no arc whatsoever, and I don't remember a single time he uses his powers in the final battle. Or any time, really. There is a deleted scene where he chases down a robber in a car, which is kind of cool. In this deleted scene, Bob is at a restaurant with the kids, and while he's changing Jack-Jack in the bathroom, a robbery occurs. I said don't move! No talking! Violet, Dad doesn't want us to get involved. But it's right in front of us! What do you expect me to do? Something! And Dash and Vi use their powers to stop them. I wish this was more of the focus of the B-plot showing the kids wanting to use their powers and finding a way to do so in secret. So later, when the big final battle happens, they sort of take charge while their parents are incapacitated. Would have been way more satisfying and naturally built up to, and utilized both of them better as characters. Edna Mode is in the movie, just to have a funny scene with Jack-Jack. She makes him a new suit. Cool. She already made him a suit in the last movie. What does this contribute story-wise? What, the kids use the new tracking device to find Jack-Jack in a blinking-you'll-miss-it moment in the final battle? That's it? In an earlier draft of the film, Edna had a very different role. Her house was hijacked by the villains and her security system went awry. Recognize the car? Robert, I've lost control of my security system! Bob and Edna had to escape the house as all her security devices tried to kill them. Again, this would have been so much better. This gets Edna involved with the main plot, and it shows a familiar setting from the first movie in a brand new way. What was before just a contemporary setting for characters to exchange dialogue is now being shown as a setting for cool action. Instead, they opted for the funny Edna and Jack-Jack crap. <laughs> oh my god. All of these little Bob with the kids plots feel very meandering. Helen stayed at home with the kids in the first movie, but she was very suspicious of Bob. And her suspicions are what led her to contact Edna, which got her involved with the story, and ultimately brought the family to the action. There was a point to it all. Here, Bob's contributions do not further the plot. The phone rings at the end of Act 2, he says he'll be there, and then he's at the site of the final battle. That's it. No build-up, no lead-in, no moment where Bob's jealousy gets the better of him and he decides to involve himself or something. Nothing. The B-plot doesn't progress the movie forward, and basically just serves as something to cut back to after a story beat in the A-plot happens. It's filler. These all feel like these could be like the plots of separate episodes in an Incredibles TV show or something. Bradbird once stated that Incredibles 2 was going to have more of a focus on the family dynamic in favor of the superhero stuff, which in theory is pretty sound, and would have worked if just it contributed to the overall story at all. So the story is pretty bad, but I think the major miss of this film is in its characters. The characters don't feel like the same ones we came to know from the first film. Everyone is out of character now, especially Bob. 
Keeping in mind this movie takes place right after the first movie, in which Bob learned to have faith in his family and let them help him, only for this movie to pretty immediately forget about that, and he gets jealous at Helen for being the hero. There is, once again, a deleted scene that played Bob's characterization differently. After a rather bad day at her new job, Helen gets a call from a supportive Bob who is uplifting and tries to make her feel better. Oh, hi, sweetie. Hey, you big day. How'd it go? I don't know. I was too fast, or the criminals were too slow, not entertaining enough. I don't know. I don't really want to talk about it. How was your day? Ah, come on. I'm sure you were great. Keep your chin up. This feels more in line with Bob's character from the end of the previous movie. In the final, it feels like he took a huge 180 and didn't learn anything. I also really dislike this line from Helen. You last to cycle. I didn't know you had a bike. Hey, I had a mohawk. There's a lot about me you don't know. Yeah, but... Aren't you two, like, married and share, like, a life together? Why would you keep your past a secret from your partner? It's little things like this that make the two feel oddly distant, when at the end of the last movie, they seemed closer than ever. Them being distant wouldn't really be a problem if there was a time gap between the two films, but because this takes place right after the first, this just feels wrong. I get that they have to have some sort of conflict between the two, but this just feels like backtracking. Now this is totally a personal preference thing, but I don't particularly like the new production design of the world. The character models are kind of off-putting to me. Because it's 2018 and everyone expects CGI to be hyper photorealistic, now the Incredibles models have been upgraded to look realer. They have more wrinkles, more defined skin textures, and are placed in a more real world setting with ultra realistic lighting. The lighting is kind of overkill at times even. Wow, you can see every piece of hair on Bob's shirt? Cool! I guess? But do we need to? The simplistic art deco design of the first movie was partly done because of the limitations of CGI at the time. 2004 CGI couldn't produce ultra-realistic looking textures, so they used that restraint to stylize the world accordingly, and it's why the characters were so cartoony in proportions. Now that the lighting and textures and world looks realer, I feel the look of the characters don't really match the setting anymore. The Good Dinosaur had a similar problem, where the settings and landscapes were absolutely breathtaking, and then the characters' cartoony proportions didn't match it at all. It clashes. Incredibles 2 looks like they took the assets from the old movie and put like a Snapchat filter on them or something. There's something weirdly uncanny about them. But hey, maybe that's just me. I'm really happy that studios are starting to realize that audiences don't want photorealistic CGI anymore and are starting to branch out into new styles. Let's come back to that original statement from Brad Bird about how this is a movie that took so long to make because he was waiting for the right story to tell. And now I ask you all this. Does this feel like a story he waited 14 years to tell? Was this really the amazing sequel The Incredibles deserved? I don't think so. I don't know what happened here. Brad Bird is a very profound director with integrity, yet he seemed to phone it in here. Was it a matter of Disney just showing up at his house with a truckload of cash and forcing him to make a sequel that he didn't want to make? Because that's kind of what it feels like to me. It's like they gave him a list of what had to be in the movie, wrote him a check for a gorillion dollars, and he just sort of rolled with it. From what I understand, this movie lost an entire year of production when Disney or whoever decided to swap its original 2019 release date with Toy Story 4's, pushing Incredibles 2 to 2018. So the film was kinda rushed, and it definitely feels that way. Would a whole extra year in the oven have been enough to work out the kinks in the story? I'd like to think so, but who really knows? Going by the behind the scenes clips, it appears they wanted to tell this story set in this period of time since the beginning. I feel this movie was limited by its weird insistence to take place directly after the first movie. I feel they should have aged up the characters, show a slightly more modern version of this world where the supers are now legal, show Dash and Violet in their 20s, maybe Violet's about to get married or something and she's going through a marriage conflict, have Bob and Helen be in their mid-50s, dealing with being older and not being able to perform the same hero duties they could before, and maybe are starting to contemplate retirement. Maybe have Bob have a moment where he realizes he isn't truly invincible, and his cracks start to show as he gets older. Have Jack-Jack be a teenager in school, 
Maybe he's like a hotshot there because he has so many powers that he likes to show off. And they're in a world now where supers don't have to hide their powers anymore. What kind of issues would he be going through? All of this sounds super interesting. And I think most of us would have wanted that. And it'd be in character for Pixar too. All the other Pixar sequels seem to use the gaps of time between films to their advantage. Lightning McQueen, for example, is at retiring age by the third Cars movie. All of the Toy Story sequels deal with Andy getting older and the toys becoming obsolete as time goes on. But for some reason, The Incredibles didn't get a similar treatment. But I think it is pretty obvious why they didn't do a time jump. Let's not try to kid ourselves. They didn't do a time jump so they could just show more of what we liked from the first film. More of the supers doing secret covert underground stuff because they're illegal. More funny haha Edna Mode moments. And a lot more silly Jack-Jack. Because he's a cute silly baby and Disney can market that. The amount of focus Jack-Jack gets in this movie is really evident of that. Oh look, they can have a scene where the two fan favorite characters interact that has no bearing on the overall plot. If they aged up the characters, we couldn't have Edna and baby Jack-Jack having a silly scene together. We couldn't have baby Jack-Jack turn big and smush the bad guys and fight a raccoon. If they aged them up, there'd be no cute baby Jack-Jack Disney could use to market the film. Look at the funny baby! And guess what? It worked. Decisions seem to have been made more in favor of what was safe and could be milked and marketed. More so than what would have been a natural, thoughtful, bold progression of the story. And that is why Incredibles 2, to me, is a bad film. It lacks integrity. Before I finish off this part of the video, I feel I should mention some of the good stuff in this. Because like any movie, it ain't all bad. First of all, the action scenes are all good. Ignoring Helen being totally blind to what could have caused this, the sequence of her chasing down the monorail and stopping it is a cool action scene, and they use her powers as much as they can. I really like the sequence of Void using portals to make Helen sort of land onto the jet. That was clever. If you go into this movie just wanting to see good action and nothing more, well, you won't be disappointed. I like that this movie still feels very adult. They don't shy away from showing things that might be unsuitable for kids, like being shot, the action scenes feeling tense, and all the bureaucracy and social commentary talk. The movie doesn't feel like it's playing down to the kids a lot of the time, and I appreciate that. I appreciate they wrote in this line of Helen calling herself a hypocrite. My husband used to listen to a police scanner, waiting for something to happen, and I got mad at him for it. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I'm such a hypocrite. Because I was literally thinking this as I was watching it. She earlier chastised Bob about wanting to break the law and do hero work. Superheroes are illegal. Whether it's fair or not, that's the law. The law should be fair. And then she herself does it. I don't know if you want to call this out of character for her, but... At least they acknowledged it, I guess. And while I personally don't like the new overly textured character models, I really enjoy the animation on them. The facial expressions in this are pushed to the max, especially on Bob. You can tell they had a great time animating him, especially in his meltdown scene. Cause I'm Mr. Incredible, not Mr. So-So or Mr. Mediocre Guy, Mr. Incredible. <laughs> All of these things, though, are kind of unimportant in the grand scheme of things. A good action scene or good animation ultimately means nothing if they're not tied to a good story. Now let's round back to my very early claim at the beginning of the video. That Incredibles 2 is Pixar's worst film. It is a bad film, but is it really the worst entry in Pixar's library? Is this actually worse than something like Cars 2? Well, in my opinion, yes. Let me explain. I know that most people will argue Cars 2 is Pixar's objectively worst movie. It did kickstart their streak of duds. Yeah, that's true. And Cars 2 is pretty damn bad. I agree. I've gone into detail about that before. But the thing is, Cars 2 is not a lazy film. It's still a completely original story and very clearly inspired by old spy thrillers. Whether that was a good decision or not for a talking race car movie is a different argument altogether, but at least it is still something new and different. A totally new story that doesn't tread the same ground as the first one. There is still integrity there. I believe it when John Lasseter says they made it because it's a story he wanted to tell. 
I cannot say the same for Incredibles 2. Incredibles 2 feels very lazy. It feels like a cash grab. It feels like Disney forcing Pixar to churn out a sequel to a popular film to milk nostalgia. And they did the bare minimum while making sure the fan favorite stuff from the first one gets a bigger percentage of screen time this time, foregoing continuity and elements that made the original so groundbreaking. Disney's current day approach to continuing franchises like this is what is killing them in my opinion, and what is killing Pixar. Pixar is a company that is capable of still telling good stories. Even most of the unnecessary sequels they've churned out do still add something to their respective franchises. Monsters University was an unwanted prequel, but it showed Mike learning to accept himself for what he is, and shows us why he and Sully are such good friends in the first place. Toy Story 4 was totally unneeded, but it gave new insight to Woody and Bo's relationship that recontextualizes them in the previous movies, in a good way. Cars 3 was definitely an unneeded sequel that no one asked for, but it tastefully used the concept of sentient cars becoming outdated as a solid metaphor for aging and learning to accept retirement, and it somehow ended up being my favorite of the Cars films. What does Incredibles 2 add to its franchise that wasn't there before? As far as I can see, nothing. I don't know if we'll ever get an Incredibles 3, and I honestly don't think I want one. Not unless they do something totally bold and new for the franchise. But who knows? It is Disney after all, and they'll make sequels to anything. No one on God's green earth ever requested a Toy Story 5. But yet, here we are. Well, I hope you all enjoyed my breakdown of the two Incredibles films. This was something totally new and different for the channel, but I felt it was time to try to start breaking out a bit. The Cars video I did last year did really well on the old channel, and it's still doing very well on this one. And ever since that, people have been asking me to do more Pixar stuff. Even people I know in real life have told me that. If this video does well, I'd love to do more. Maybe the Toy Story series? Or in every movie ranking? Who knows? I know that Star Wars video I've been talking about has been on the back burner forever. Maybe it's time to finally get around to that. The Thomas content will be returning as always. I'd like to get back to the Thomas retrospective. I think another Sodor's Finest is due soon. Or maybe another Top 10 CGI Episodes video. Everyone seemed to like that one. At the time of recording, I have not posted a poll on Patreon, so the next video will be decided from that. If you'd like to get in on the Patreon action, the link is in the description below. You get to vote on new content, participate in the monthly Q&A, and you get access to all new videos two days early, including the one you're watching right now. Thanks again everyone for the support, and I will see you all in the next one.